the week leading up to the Indian GP, one of the final races on the 2013 F1 calendar. And I'm absolutely thrilled to have Anthony Rollinson, the editor of F1 Racing magazine, joining me to talk about the Indian GP and the state of Formula One. Anthony, thank you so much for taking the time and being there with us today. Not at all. It's a, it's a pleasure. And I just wanted to start things off, obviously, because it's, you know, it's Indian GP uh, week. And uh, we're recording this on the Saturday. Next weekend, the cars will be in action. Is Sebastian Vettel going to win the World Championship in India? I mean, we know we can't make absolutes in Formula 1, but it looks like it's a done deal now, isn't it? Um, well, I think it's, it's almost inevitable, isn't it? And uh, fair play to him if he does. He's had an amazing season again, uh, driving an amazing car, making very few mistakes. So, you know... If if he does, the all credit all credit to him. It's a little bit uh, probably repetitive for fans of the sport, but um, you can't really take it away from the guy. He's 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 done everything he needs to to win the title. And it's this season also. You know, we've seen we've kind of tended to see Sebastian and the car perhaps work together as well as any car and driver combination uh, in Formula One over the past maybe ten twenty years almost. Like harking back to Schumacher and that Ferrari that could just about give an extra ten percent in Michael's hands. That seems to be the case with Sebastian because Mark Webber hasn't really been able to match up perhaps just in terms of raw pace. Yeah, I think that's a very fair comment. I mean, the, the relationship that uh, Seb has with his team and obviously with Adrian Newey, who's the, uh, the, you know, the chief technical officer, you know, the technical boss of the team. Uh, it's, it's a formidable partnership and that, that Schumacher-Ferrari parallel is a very uh, accurate one uh, because it's, it's the nearest thing anyone seen in recent Formula 1 history to sort of complete domination of the sport. I think, you know, you'd have to go back to sort of Jim Clark and Lotus in the, in the, in the 60s. It's that kind of very close relationship that a, that a driver has with their, with their team and the, the, the technical chief. And it just, when it happens, it, it creates domination and, and we're seeing it again. Staying with the Indian Grand Prix for a bit, obviously we have a lot of uh, Ferrari fans in India. We have a lot of Lewis Hamilton fans in India. Let's talk about Ferrari first. Lots yep. of things happening behind the scenes, but uh, do you get a sense that for now, at least for the team and for Fernando, it's very much a case of just get through the season and worry about uh, next year? Uh, I think that's possibly true. I think that's only really happened in the last race or two. Um, Fernando definitely was a contender for the title this year until, you know, probably th almost three quarters of the way through the season or two thirds of the way through the season. But the run that Seb's put together since uh, the Belgian Grand Prix this year, since F1 sort of came back from its summer break, has just broken the championship for everybody else and sort of cr crushed his rivals, really. I, I mean, Fernando's a fantastic competitor, uh, as we saw last year, taking the title to the last race um, in, a, in a car that wasn't as good as the Red Bull. Um, this year, he's been formidable. Uh, I think of the Belgian Grand Prix this year, where he finished a fantastic second place. Spa, uh, sorry, Suzuka a couple of weeks ago, um, a brilliant fourth um, career. No, sorry, Singapore. He finished fantastic second. I mean, he's able to sort of make up places from relatively poor grid positions. So the fighting spirit is there, but uh, the, the championship's gone from now. I, th I think just to answer your question specifically, I don't think he's given up on the season. I think if, if there's a sniff of a win, he'd still take it. But I think mentally, the team have checked out now, really, and, and they are focused pretty heavily on 2014. I just want to talk about, you know, the relationship with Fernando and the team right now. Because last year as well, I was in the paddock for the Indian Grand Prix. And coming into the Indian GP, you had a few, you know, chats about Fernando's not happy with Ferrari. Ferrari's not happy with Fernando. But when you walked into the motorhome, you saw this relationship that he had with the engineers, with Stefano Domenicali. And things were really, really tight. But somehow mm -hmm. I get the sense that it's a little bit different right now. Definitely something has changed a bit this year. You're quite right. Um, I think the talk in the middle of the season that Fernando wanted to go to Red Bull uh, probably altered the relationship a little bit. And that, that wasn't just purely rumour. There was definitely some, some substance to that because uh, Fernando, or at least his representatives, did talk to Christian Horner. The, the investigations were made about Fernando going to Red Bull. And I think once a driver starts looking around and once the team knows their driver is looking around, it brings that little bit of instability in. And I think that's probably the background to Kimi Raikkonen joining the team, which uh, is something that Fernando, I'm quite sure, isn't that happy about. Um, and there's certain factions within the team that aren't that happy, but there are other factions that are very pleased that Kimi's coming back. So that sort of wonderful stability that Red Bull have, which is the bedrock of their success, really, that's, that's slightly in question at Ferrari. I wouldn't say they're unstable, but you know, the whole Kimi Raikkonen element and where Fernando is at with the team definitely raises questions that aren't there for, for 
Red Bull. It looks odds on at the moment that Sebastian will win the uh, World Championship at the Indian Grand Prix. But given Mercedes and Lotus's performances over the last few races and the characteristics of the Bud circuit at the moment, do, do Lewis and say Kimi and maybe even Romain Grosjean have a shot at challenging Seb in India? Because he's won the last two races pretty much in a canter, at least the Indian Grand Prix over the last couple of years. Yeah, uh, I think I think you're right to focus on both those uh, rivals. I, I don't think Ferrari are in the picture. I think Roma and or Kimi uh, will be strong. They they seem to be the closest car on pure pace to the to the Red Bull. Certainly over race distance now. So I'd look to them, um, and it'd be fantastic to see Roman get his first win. I think he's I think he's ready for it. He's shown that with his recent performances, and it's always great to see a driver get their first win. Lewis, it's difficult to say. I'd love to have seen what he would have been able to do at Suzuka if he hadn't had that first lap fumble that put him out of the race because he was clearly in feisty form trying to break through uh, the, the two Red Bulls. Um, the car looked quick in qualifying, maybe not Red Bull quick, but over race distance, again, who knows? So I think Mercedes are a little bit of an unknown uh, at, at Bud. Um, but unfortunately, the f- well, I say unfortunately, uh, I, shouldn't, I shouldn't be so judgmental that the Red Bulls are clearly favourites once again. Obviously, Indian Grand Prix, lots of fans for Force India. And the teams, you know, after that superb start, they've gone a bit quiet. We've heard about how, you know, the, t- the changes to the tyres mid-season has done that to Force India. But a little bit also, do you think it's the fact that the drivers seem to have their heads down a bit, at least especially Paul De Resta, for the second half of the season, just doesn't seem to feel like he's got his heart in it 100%, though he is trying uh, very, very hard. Yeah, I think something's not quite right there. I think that's fair to say. Um, I think uh, even Paul's manager admitted earlier in this week, uh, Richard Goddard, that Paul's future is, short term at least, uh, not secure. That doesn't mean he's out of the sport at all. We shouldn't go that far, but he doesn't have a nailed on drive for next season. I think when drivers know that, it can bring a little bit of edge and perhaps desperation to their to their driving. And I think, you know, Paul's made a couple of mistakes recently. And that may well be legacy of trying a little bit too hard to sort of, you know, prove prove he's the real deal. Sometimes you overdrive and, and, and bin the car, and he's done that a couple of times. A final word on the Indian Grand Prix itself, Anthony. Obviously, next year we're not on the calendar, but the Indian promoters here are talking about the fact that they still have two races under contract with Bernie, should be back in 2015. I know from the sense I got last year from the paddock was that people enjoy India and the fans in India once they come to India. But perhaps it's not the easiest place in the moment in the world at the moment for the Formula One circus to roll up at. There's, we've had logistical issues, we've had taxation issues, we've had members of the media just having a lot of trouble trying to get visas to come here. So, mm-hmm. but what do you get? What's the sense you get of the future of the Indian Grand Prix? Will Formula One be back here in 2015? Can we look forward to that? Uh, well, um, that's a tricky question, I think. Uh, I think once a race slips off the calendar, it, and this is in general terms, not being specific about India, but once a race slips off the calendar, it can be hard for it to come back. I mean, as we've seen with uh, French Grand Prix at the moment, that's probably a classic example, if you like, a very well-established Grand Prix, and it's just not on, you know, just not happening anymore. Although I think the situation there is purely financial, which I don't think applies to Bud in the same way. Um Normally, however, these things do come down to money. So behind the scenes, I would imagine there is probably a financial wrangle going on between whoever is exactly running Bud these days. Because I'm not quite sure since JP uh, disappeared from the scene. And uh, No, it's still very much JP. It's just that I think they've reduced the international profile a little bit because uh, they're still trying to get to grips with what they're doing. It's still JP running the race because they've been making the statements in the weeks uh, leading up as well. Right. Well, that's interesting. That's interesting because we don't get all the uh, we get a you know slightly skewed view from the UK um, of exactly what's going on. So um, I would imagine that underneath it all, there's a financial disagreement, whatever of whatever nature that is, because normally that's the case. Uh, and the reason why races like uh, I don't know, say the Korean Grand Prix, uh, go ahead in in the middle of nowhere, no, 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 middle of nowhere, no fans. <laughs> No, it's no a bit of a strange race, race, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, it's it's a strange race. You know, it's a decent circuit, but a you know very odd location. Um, but the reason that goes ahead is because it's it's underwritten by the Korean government. So, um, you know, that side of things isn't a problem. And as long as the money's there, Formula One will keep turning up. So, without being party to the financial dealings, uh, I I would imagine that's probably what's what's underlying the, the the problems with Bud. Coming up in part two of this special podcast with F1 Racing's Anthony Rawlinson, we dive into the new regulations for the 2014 season. Look at how the driver market is shaking down. 
and discuss if the new regulations for 2014 will change the pecking order and which teams are in the right place to take advantage.